You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Phillips Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello everyone, I'm Mike McDaniel and I'm the preacher for the Central Church of Christ in Carothersville, Missouri. Thanks so much for watching A Bible Answer today. We have three gospel preachers with us who are here to answer questions that have been sent in from you, our viewers. We'll have them introduce themselves to you at this time. My name is Robert Taylor. I live in Ripley, Tennessee, a member of the Ripley Church of Christ. do a great deal of preaching and teaching and uh, a certain amount of writing. Hello, my name is Sammy Hamilton. Uh, I live in Memphis, Tennessee. I also preached for the Graves Road Church of Christ there in Memphis, Tennessee. My name is Cameron Freeman. I'm originally from Montgomery, Alabama, but I currently preach for the East Haven Church of Christ in Memphis, Tennessee as well. Thank you. Good to have these brethren with us today to take time out of their busy schedules to answer your questions on a Bible answer. Now our first question today goes to Brother Hamilton. Brother Hamilton, the person asks, how did Diotrephes cast some out of the church? Brother Hamilton. Uh, thank you for that question. We, we find that in uh, 3 John 10 through 11, the Apostle John intended to visit Gaius uh, and the congregation where he worshiped. When John arrived, he would show Diotrephes actions in their true light as rebellion. Diotrephes' lordship over the congregation falls into two categories. First, he spoke against John and his associates. He is pictured by the word prating uh, as using empty, foolish words, making empty charges with empty, well, rather with evil words. Second, the author fees went beyond words of actions. He refused to accept the Christian workers who came from John. He then, by intimidation, moved to uh, prevent others to do so in the assembly. And those who refused uh, what John, uh, rather Diotrephes did, he expelled from the membership of the congregation. Uh, and I, this does not mean that Diotrephes or anyone else uh, of this sort actually was able to sever faithful Christians from the Lord's church. Uh, the Lord adds to his church according to Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. But we can be sure that uh, when the Apostle John would come as he had promised, as he had promised, and he would deal with the situation when he arrived. And the Diotrephes would be divested of any authority uh, in the congregation. And if he would not repent, uh, then he would be excluded from the fellowship of the Lord's church. Uh, and so I, I think the term is used, cast some out, or is he throw them out. But the point of it is, is that uh, nobody can cast anyone or throw them out of the Lord's church. Uh, there is, when one does not follow doctrine, the truth, then one sometimes in some cases must be disfellowship. Uh, but no one can throw us out of the Lord's church. And even when that happens, it's because uh, we have violated God's scripture. I thank you for that question. Thank you, Brother Freeman. Does John 1.7 teach, John 1.17 teach that there was no grace under the Old Testament and no law under the New Testament? Brother Freeman. Thank you, Brother McDaniel, for that question. And that's a great question, seeing that many have come to that conclusion. Uh, when they read John 1.17, uh, they've come to the conclusion that there was no grace uh, under the Old Testament and that we have no law under the New Testament. But I believe that what John 1.17 is teaching, when John says, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ, uh, a couple of interesting things is that John uh, was showing us that uh, there were two systems or two covenants. Uh, the first covenant given by Moses as the lawgiver uh, in the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 19, 20. And also um, the second covenant, the new covenant, which was given by God's son, Jesus Christ, according to Matthew 26, 
26 through 28. So what John 117 is showing us contextually is that there were two systems or two covenants, one given by Moses and also one given by Jesus Christ. But as it pertains to the question of whether or not they had grace in the Old Testament, um, I believe a scripture that will help all of us to appreciate uh, the, the subject of grace is 1 Peter 5.10. What Peter says, but the God of all grace, who has called us to his eternal glory uh, by Christ Jesus, uh, perfect, established strength and settle you. And so Peter identifies the fact that the God of heaven, the God who is the creator of the world, the God in whose image that we are made, the God who sent Jesus uh, for our salvation, that God is the God of all grace. So in simple terms, um, where God is or where God's presence is found, there's grace. Uh, and so God was in the Old Testament and we read about God uh, in the beginning, Genesis 1 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So in the Old Testament, grace was found. And to, to supplement that fact, I just noticed a couple of passages. Genesis 6, 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Exodus 33, right after Moses was given the law. Exodus 33, 17, Moses, uh, God told Moses or reminded Moses that he had found grace in his sight. And also in Psalm 103 and verse number 8, the Bible says that the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. So the Bible makes it abundantly clear that grace was in the Old Testament. And to the second part of the question, um, as there was grace in the Old Testament, there's law in the New Testament. The Bible also makes it abundantly clear that there is law in the New Testament. Paul talks about the law of the Spirit, Romans 8, 2, that the law of the Spirit had made him free from the law of sin and death. And also, Paul talks about uh, the law of Christ, Galatians 6 and verse number 2, where he says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. And then James talks about the law in James 1.25, the perfect law of liberty. So in the Old Testament, they had grace, and in the New Testament, we have law. Uh, many people want to throw away law in the New Testament because they think God's grace is going to cover every sin where men uh, will live and will not repent of, but they're just not true. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6 and verse number 1, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. So we have law, we have doctrine, we have God's truth to keep us within the parameters of God's will, even in the, even in the New Testament. Thank you for your questions. Thank you. And now to Brother Taylor. Is capital punishment biblical? Brother Taylor. Thanks for this question. <clears throat> and the question we have biblical and of course the Bible is composed of the Old Testament, Genesis through Malachi, and also the New Testament for Matthew through Revelation. It's my firm conviction and understanding that capital punishment was true under the Old Testament and likewise is approved in the New Testament for certain crimes, for the crimes that are so serious in nature. Many people contend that we are still under the Ten Commandments. I wonder if they've thought through this, because if the Ten Commandments are still in effect, then the punishments that went with the violation of these would also be in effect. Every single one of these call for capital punishment when violated. Idolatry call for capital punishment and disobedience to parents call for capital punishment. A failure to honor the seventh day of the week, that is be a faithful Sabbath keeper, call for capital punishment. There was a man in the book of Numbers who picked up sticks on the Sabbath day and they stoned him. And we read about Korah and his company in the wilderness, how that the earth opened up and swallowed them. That is the, the administration of capital punishment by the power of God Himself. And of course, we have murder and adultery. Both of these call for capital punishment. Thou shall not covet. People who were covetous uh, were subject to punishment by, by, by capital or in capital punishment. And uh, thou shall not steal. Those who violated that law were subject to, to, to capital punishment. Remember Achan in the time of Joshua as they were conquering the city of Jericho? They were absolutely forbidden 
to take anything of the spoils of the city. Achan violated that and hid what he had stolen in his own tent, and evidently his family was also accessory to him. He was stoned. He was put to death. Capital punishment. But what about the New Testament? I believe the New Testament also authorizes it. We are told in Romans, the 13th chapter, as well as 1 Peter, the 2nd chapter, some wonderful information that we have about human government and why human government has been brought under the teaching of God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. And in the Roman passage, mention is made about the governing official, the one who administers justice, that he does not bear the sword in vain. The sword was an implement of putting people to death. That just simply meant that uh, uh, he had the power to put people to death for the committing of certain, ter certain crime. In Acts the 24th chapter and Acts the 25th chapter, Paul is imprisoned in the city of Caesarea, and he appears before Felix in the early part of that imprisonment, and then also before Ephesus in the latter part of the chapter. And whenever the Jews who hated Paul, who were determined to put him to death, whenever they asked Festus for permission to bring Paul from Caesarea to Jerusalem, fully intending to waylay him and murder him, Paul, in response, uh, suggested, if I have done anything that is contrary to the law or the temple, I refuse not to die. But if I be, if I be innocent of everything that they have alleged against me, no man may deliver me unto them. I appeal unto Caesar. Is capital punishment biblical? Yes. Biblical in the Old Testament and also biblical in the New Testament. And it just seems to me that if we had more in the way of punishment for people who murder, for people who commit acts of violence, uh, who do things that are disruptive to people, that we would have less in the way of civil disservices, civil disobedience. Thank you for the good question. Thank you. We've reached the halfway point of our program today. We want to offer you a free tract. Our tract today is entitled, Does It Matter Which Church I Attend? If you'd like to have this tract, or if you'd like to have our free lesson Bible correspondence course, which you may take in the privacy of your home, or to send us your question, just contact us. You can write us at Philip Street Church of Christ, 912 Philip Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. You can contact us by means of our contact page on our website. That web address is www.abibleanswertv.org. Or you can email us at abibleanswer at earthlink.net. Or you can call our toll-free number, 1-800-436-0463. If you call that number, though, and leave, uh, leave your address, please do so in a good, clear voice so that we can take that down and meet your request. Now back to our questions today. To Brother Hamilton, does the Bible teach that it's wrong to judge? Brother Hamilton. Uh, thank you for that question. Let me say first, no. John 7, 24, Jesus said, Judge not according to the appearance of but judge righteous judgment. In Matthew the seventh chapter, Jesus is instructing his followers not to make hasty negative judgments about others. Jesus did not leave his disciples to leave all judgments behind because living the Christian life requires righteous discernment. In Matthew 7, 2, Jesus said, for with what judgments ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And so Jesus is talking about uh, the type of judging discernment between good and evil. Jesus said later in Matthew 7, 15 through 16, he said, beware of false prophets 
Uh, and he said that you will know them by their fruit. Jesus was saying that they would have to judge the doctrine and the lifestyle uh, of those teachers to determine if they were true or false and to decide if their fruits were good or bad. Jesus' exhortation forbids personal judgment based solely upon one's own criteria. So he urges the use of God's righteousness, God's standard of judgment. And so we can ask the question, how can we know that one is in error without judging him by God's righteous standard? Jesus commands us that we must, we must, we must view in, in context here uh, of the Sermon on the Mount. And what Jesus said, he lets us know that, that judgment can refer to choosing, uh, selecting or determining judgments. And what Jesus was condemning was self-righteous judgment. And that's what he had to say about that. And so if we could not judge people, then certainly we would be at a loss. I thank you for that question. Thank you. Now to Brother Freeman. Why does the English Standard Version and some translations say that Jesus preached in the synagogues of Judea in Luke 4.44, while the King James Version and some others say he preached in the synagogues of Galilee? I will give that to you, Brother Freeman. Once again, thank you for that great question. And I believe that's one of those questions um, that um, needs to be answered in the light of the fact that um, we always need to keep in mind that God's word is true. God's word is right. God's word is accurate. Um, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect truly furnished unto all good works. And so that question uh, is a great question from the vantage point of uh, just by casual observation, casual reading, a person uh, who just picks up the Bible and opens the Bible may read that looking at two different versions and may believe that the Bible um, serves as a contradiction. There are many skeptics and scoffers and cynics and critics, uh, especially dis destructive critics uh, who want the Bible to be a uh, contradicting uh, piece of literature, but the Bible is not a contradiction. What you have in Luke uh, chapter 4, um, verse number 44 in ESV and also Luke 4, 44 in the KJV, what you have, uh, both of those different versions used uh, different manuscripts. Uh, based upon research, uh, the King James Version used what was known as the Tectus Receptus or the Received Text. Um, it was also known as the Majority Text. The ESV, which was a uh, revised version of the RSV, um, of 2001, the ESV uses uh, as its manuscript basis uh, the Westcott Hort manuscript, which is a compilation of the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus manuscripts. So because of using two different types of manuscripts, you have two different uh, answers given based on the version in which one uses. But I believe that the context of Luke chapter 4 shows us that is Galilee. In Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, Jesus was in Nazareth, which was in Galilee. In Luke chapter 4 and verse number 31 through 38, Jesus was in Capernaum. Uh, and also in verse 44, he was still uh, in Galilee. So depending on whether you use the ESV or the KJV, when one looks at the context, Luke chapter 4 shows us that Jesus was in the synagogue in Galilee. Thank you. Thank you. And that's exactly right. The context is clear, isn't it? That it's just obvious that Judea is not correct uh, there in that verse and that it's talking about preaching in the synagogues of Galilee. That's where he was. Uh, Brother Taylor, does man have a sinful nature? Brother Taylor. I appreciate this question, and may I answer with just a couple of words? Absolutely not. Man's nature comes from God, and to say that a person is born in sin, born with a sinful nature, is really an insult to God and a reflection upon him. And yet there are people who have put into their religious creeds that man is born in sin. Man is as sinful at the time he is a babe as even the old devil himself. And that doctrine has reached proportions that have caused anxiety and much confusion among people who have accepted that. 
I have some distant relatives uh, who belong to a religious organization that for a long time their creed taught that babies are born in sin. And yet in the early part of the 1900s, they changed that doctrine and said man is not born with a sinful nature. The families that I have in mind who belong to that organization had some children, uh, according to the creed, born in sin, and then their later children, their younger children, were born without sin. And yet that did not make a dent in the families that should have realized there is a real serious contradiction here. Man is born perfectly pure. Every baby that comes into the world is a, a precious object, a precious gift from God, and he does not send to the father and the mother one who is as sinful as the devil himself. That little child is born without sin and will be safe until reaching the age of accountability or responsibility, and then will be responsible for the sins that he commits as a teenager or as an adult person. And so this is a doctrine that is as wrong as it can be. It falls into the same category of suggesting that God from the beginning ordained everything that is about to come, everything that man does has been ordained of God, and uh, that no man will be able to change any of that. I'm reminded of a debate that I heard about, and uh, the debater for our side, for the Christian side, met a man who believed in the eternal planning of God, the eternal purpose uh, that everything is ordained, for ordained and nothing can change. In fact, he had an apple that he brought to the debate, and he held up that, that apple to the audience, and he said, God, before the foundation of the world, ordained that I plant the apple seed that resulted in the apple tree that produced this apple. He also foreordained or demanded that I bring this to the debate and that I eat this apple during the debate. Our debater somehow got the apple and ate it, ate it himself. And every time the man would make a point, he'd say, just like that apple. Well, he couldn't accuse the, the, his opponent of stealing because according to his doctrine, God ordained that. Well, that doctrine also, just like sinful nature, is not taught in the Bible. Thank you for the good question. Thank you. And now to Brother Hamilton. When did the New Testament come into effect and when did the Old Testament end? Brother Hamilton. Thank you, Brother McDaniels. I would like to answer the question in the reverse order which it was asked. The Old Testament, the Old Covenant, uh, also called the Law of Moses, was abolished at the cross. The Bible says in Colossians 2 and verse 14, blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that were against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Galatians chapter 3, 23 through 25 tells us that it has served its purpose, but before faith came, we were kept under the law, uh, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Uh, and 24 and 25 tells us the purpose, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster or our tutor to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Uh, and uh, when we, when, we, when we do that, then we're no longer under the schoolmaster. The law of Christ became operative in force on the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And according to Acts chapter 2, that's what happened. It was on that day uh, Christ was preached. Men were offered remission of sins uh, by the authority of Christ. According to Acts chapter 2, verses 22 through 41, and where the scripture tells us about 3,000 souls obeyed the gospel from that day forward, all who obey the blessed gospel of Christ were added uh, to the church by the Lord. Acts chapter 2, verse 47. Thank you for your question. 
Thank you very much for watching a Bible Answer today. We appreciate all of our viewers and, and the great job that our panelists do each week in answering your questions. We have a number of congregations that support a Bible Answer, which we want to bring to you. The Anna Church of Christ in Anna, Illinois. The Bethel Church of Christ in Martin, Tennessee. The Bishop, Church of, Bishop Street Church of Christ in Union City, Tennessee. The Bradford Church of Christ, Bradford, Tennessee. The Central Church of Christ in Crothersville, Missouri, where I preach. The Dexter Church of Christ, Dexter, Missouri. The Donovan Church of Christ, Donovan, Missouri. The Doris Chapel Church of Christ in Trenton, Tennessee. The Dresden Church of Christ, Dresden, Tennessee. Eastwood Church of Christ, Paris, Tennessee. The Fairview Church of Christ, Milan, Tennessee. The Fremont Church of Christ, Union City, Tennessee. The Front Street Church of Christ, Milan, Tennessee. The Gardner Church of Christ in Martin, Tennessee. The Greenfield Church of Christ in Greenfield, Tennessee. The Hickory Grove Church of Christ, Almo, Kentucky. The Maple Hill Church of Christ, Benton, Kentucky. The Marion Church of Christ, Marion, Illinois. The Matthews Church of Christ, Matthews, Missouri. The Main Street Church of Christ in Troy, Tennessee. The Mount Zion Church of Christ near Hornbeak, Tennessee. The Mounds Church of Christ, Mounds, Illinois. The Neboville Church of Christ, Newburn, Tennessee. The New Johnsonville Church of Christ, New Johnsonville, Tennessee. The Palmersville Church of Christ, Palmersville, Tennessee. The Phillips Street Church of Christ in Dyersburg, Tennessee, which is our overseeing congregation for a Bible answer. The Pleasant Hill Church of Christ, Trenton, Tennessee. Portageville Church of Christ, Portageville, Missouri. Pottsville Church of Christ, Pottsville, Kentucky. Ripley Church of Christ, Ripley, Tennessee. Samford near Still, Missouri. Sharon in Sharon, Tennessee. Sunny Slope near Paducah, Kentucky. Troy Road in O'Bine, Tennessee. Yorkville Church of Christ, Yorkville, Tennessee. Westport Church of Christ in Westport, Tennessee. Woodlock Church of Christ near Paris, Tennessee. And the Williams Chapel Church of Christ, not far from our present location here in Murray, Kentucky. That's 38 congregations of the Churches of Christ throughout this region that help bring a Bible answer to you. And that's why we don't solicit donations on a Bible answer. We're grateful to them. We invite you to worship with them. Thanks for watching a Bible answer today. And remember, for your Bible questions, there's always a Bible answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for a Bible answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with a faithful Church of Christ in your area.